Okay, we're well rolling. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, let's just, I mean, this voting algorithm that we did is arguably uh, interesting in its own right to aggregate votes or customer reviews in a kind of most informative way to find the, the community sentiment and to kind of negotiate outliers. Usually outliers are thrown out by a hard decision. Usually systems have a threshold and if an outlier exceeds the threshold it is just tossed out. But here everyone's vote is taken into account but uh, the system automatically adjusts the weights uh, as it produces the ranks, right? So this is actually uh, probably more important than just being a voting aggregation algorithm is that it's example of iterative refinement algorithms and the, what we call the fixed point uh, uh, method. So let's see what this means. You remember uh, we had this uh, uh, voting uh, lists with uh, items and we had uh, voters, right? This is a bit right. And in one direction, voters give their preferences, they pick uh, the items, it's a, all right, and one item in uh, each, um, on each list, so this is list L1, this is a list, say, LK, and the system, the algorithm, uh, assigns simultaneously, that's important, uh, the ranks row I on the list L, so remember this is, if this is list uh, uh, L, uh, uh, then, uh, and this is it, item on list L, right? So, in, uh, on the other hand, sim we simultaneously assign the trustworthiness rank for each rater or voter, so to be compliant with the paper, uh, uh, let's, uh, Dealt with R, and so we have two ways kind of calculation. From the trustworthiness ranks, we compute the sorry from the trustworthiness of raters or voters. We compute the rating or rank, depending how you want to call it, of each item on the list, and in this direction. Uh, from the uh, ranks, uh, we compute the trustworthiness of the voter. And then we keep spinning this circle, this procedure, until these guys stop changing much. So you would put a threshold, say, 10 to the minus 6, and then you will do uh, the operation uh, and you can have very different measures uh, of distance, but you can, for example, um, do that until the norm of the difference. So sum i equals from 1 uh, to the, uh, altogether the number of rows, uh, let's find it this way, of uh, uh, row i uh, at iteration n squared minus uh, rho i at iteration n minus 1, and then I, sh I guess I should put it like this to keep it more uh, readable. All right? Um, to a squared, right, is smaller 
or equal than some epsilon. So we treat all of these rows, right? We concatenate them and we treat them as a one very high dimensional vector, right? And we stop when, uh, oops, oh God, sorry, I am still not asleep. Uh, it's uh, row n minus, uh, oh gosh, uh, I don't know what's wrong with me. So row i to uh, n iteration minus row i n the previous iteration and then square is smaller than epsilon. This is simply to say that uh, the two norm of uh, 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 row vector row n iteration minus row, so these are now vectors, right? Uh, n minus 1 iteration, the two norm is smaller or equal than epsilon. This is when the algorithm stops. Okay, so what, the computation, what does the algorithm look like? Well, the idea is, uh, right, in uh, uh, this direction, right, uh, tr is simply equal to the sum of trustworthiness of all um, over all L and I so that R has voted on the list L for a right and I, right? Uh, a row, so this will be trustworthiness, say, at uh, stage of iteration N. This will be ranks at stage of iteration N minus 1 Li. So in this direction, the voter simply co collects the sum of ranks of all objects he voted for, right? In the opposite direction, right, uh, we have two entities. We have, we had, um, uh, I think I called it sigma L i is simply sum of the trustworthiness of all raters R such that R voted on the list L for item I. And uh, as I mentioned, we might take TR to a power alpha, which is kind of a design parameter. Larger alpha makes the system more robust, but it tends to marginalize uh, lots of voters, right? And it emphasizes only those that have really high ranks. Huh? And then uh, rho um, Li is simply sigma Li divided by square root of the sum of sigma Li um, squared when, let's put it this way, I belongs to the least L, right? So this is just to normalize so that uh, on every list, uh, all the squares of rows uh, sum up to one. So essentially, so in this way, vector of rows, uh, um, sorry, the vector of ranks uh, has norm one, it belongs to the unit sphere. And this is used in the convergence uh, proof. Without this, the algorithm doesn't converge. But what I wanted to uh, tell you more, uh, more importantly um, here is I can replace these sigmas here with um, this expression, right? Uh, and then I can substitute these rows here, right? So this is kind of a m now m very messy formula, and perhaps we don't need to write it explicitly, but I simply substitute these guys here, and then I sub substitute these guys here, and as a, the outcome, and sorry, this is all 
n r, uh, this will be all n minus one iteration, uh, this will be all, sorry, this will be n iteration, right? And here we have n iteration, and of course, trustworthiness, this will be n iteration. Um, so, notice if the, the uh, sorry, just one second, I'm uh, having a feeling I am messing up something. Uh, yes, so it's better if we do, <coughs> if we put, if we call this also n minus first iteration because it's computed from n minus one rank. Here it's also n minus one, but now this is the new value and so here is n, and uh, here is uh, um, n. Okay, am I messing it up? I'm sorry. I want to make sure that uh, what I write down. Please make them both n. Sorry? Please make them both n. Okay, so it's uh, we start with initial. Uh, so this is the previous stage of uh, iteration, and we now want to build both the new sigmas. Ah, right. Um, and so now, uh, let's see. Uh, we will have a new rank TR, <coughs> right? will be sum of uh, uh, L I such that uh, R voted for L I and then here we will have rank uh, N rank of L I but um, the, I can now replace uh, this rank here right with this expression so this will be here equal to the sum and then here I'll have a, um, sigma L I divided by square root uh, of uh, sum of uh, sigma L J I should not use uh, so this is dummy index j, right? Some uh, when j belongs to L, but this now itself is equal to the sum uh, j, uh, and this will be sum of over Li such that R voted for Li. So here is uh, L uh, I such that R voted uh, L I and then I have uh, instead of this sigma L I I have this so it's sigma R sigma over all R such that <coughs> R voted <coughs> for L I right uh, and uh, uh, I will have uh, um, of uh, what did we have t? This will be now iteration uh, n minus one, right? Uh, n minus one. Um, so this will be equal to. Um, let me see, so sigma Li of uh, Tr n minus 1. Right, and here I'll have sum, and then here I'll have this sigma, and I do exactly the same replacement here, and it will be sigma um, of uh, R such that R voted Lj uh, T. R 
um, n minus 1, right? Uh, and then this squared. So when the sigmas start, uh, the differences between sigmas become smaller and smaller. Clear, clearly, also the difference, because it's expressible in terms of sigmas, the difference between the value of the trustworthiness of water R at n will be, will be not very different from iteration n minus 1. And essentially, when the iteration stops, these guys will be the same. So what we are looking is actually, we are looking for a tr vector in a vector right over all r that is equal. And let me call this expression phi of vector tr. And look what we are actually looking. We are looking for the fixed point of this vector function, right? Think of this as variables, right? So we are looking for the fixed point of a mapping, but unlike page rank, the mapping is because of this is no longer linear, right? And the proof of existence of uh, the, the fixed point is very different. You can read it in the notes. And moreover, one can show that TR is simply limit when n goes to infinity of um, uh, phi applied to phi applied to phi <coughs> applied to the initial vector t0, right? And this is n times, uh, right? And uh, this tells you uh, why our algorithms work, al our algorithm work. Because eventually, as you keep each round of iteration applies this function once. And of course, um, as n grows, this approaches the fixed point, right? And so as I say, the algorithm uh, as a voting aggregation algorithm is interesting in its own right. But it is more important that it is an example of a huge number of algorithms out there, which are iterative kind of refinement algorithms. And they are rapidly displacing even algorithms <coughs> that are single shot algorithms, no iteration, so totally finitary algorithms, for example, for uh, solving systems of linear equations. Uh, we don't do Gaussian elimination with pivoting and whatnot. We simply find uh, um, the solution we, uh, as a fixed point uh, of, uh, of an operator that is uh, just iteration. You are trying to minimize the difference, uh, the root square mean difference uh, between, so if you are looking for a of x equals to b, you are trying to minimize the difference between the norm of a x minus b, and you do it iteratively by um, computing iteratively new approximations of x that converge, in fact, to eventually to the solution b. And this is what all the software packages like MATLAB or Mathematica or just name it uh, actually implement. No one does uh, Gaussian elimination anymore. In fact, you see, uh, you remember when we did the page rank, we showed that, that page rank is uh, just uh, uh, the eigenvector of a matrix. 
It used to be until probably 15 years ago or so that the way how we find eigenvectors is first we find the eigenvalue. And this eigenvalue is found by solving the polynomial, the characteristic polynomial, right? Um, it is simply a i a11 minus x and so on the diagonal you have minus x and a i j otherwise so the determinant of this is a polynomial and then you use for example Newton Ralphson method to find the, the solutions to the equation that this is equal to zero <coughs> believe it or not nowadays things completely flipped the other way around. So we no longer solve polynomial equations, algebraic equations, by newton raphson method. What we do, uh, like Mathematica or MATLAB or any important uh, software package for uh, scientific computation, it actually has a trick how from the polynomial, how it constructs a matrix whose determinant is your polynomial, and then it uses matrix decomposition, matrix operations to find the eigenvalues. So it's exactly the opposite of what we used to do. We used algebraic equations to find the eigenvalues. Now we actually use eigenvalues to find the solutions to algebraic equations. And uh, uh, so um, the bottom line is that uh, iterative methods are increasingly uh, favored because they tend to be far more uh, robust, numerically robust. So and next thing what we are going to do is uh, we are going to do another class of uh, uh, fixed point uh, uh, algorithms, and that's uh, uh, the, what's called the iterative filtering algorithms. Okay, so I mentioned last time you should read uh, uh, the introduction to the notes that uh, deals with uh, very basic uh, probability and uh, statistics. Uh, so, and I don't want to bug you here with, uh, well, maybe with some calculations, but the rest you can uh, just read in the notes. You see, the point of these formulas is how you should, of course, you never make an effort to memorize them. But you understand how the proof goes, just like Buster theorem last semester, right? And then you can reconstruct the calculation yourself. So why do we need the iterative filtering algorithms? So I sh should just tell you briefly what uh, maximum likelihood estimation is. Uh, Likelihood is essentially the inverse of probability. In what sense? If I have a coin, I can tell you that the probability of getting a head is 50%. So you know that if you do lots of experiments, about half of them will be heads and about half of them tails. So probability tells you um, what kind of experiment you should, uh, outcome of experiment <coughs> you should expect. If uh, the coin is biased, say two to one, then you know there will be twice as many heads on average. Likelihood is opposite. Likelihood is when you have a real realization, uh, and yeah, you are looking for what is uh, the most likely probability distribution to give you that particular outcome, uh, right? So for example, uh, I would say you, you toss, a, you have a coin, you have no idea 
about probability of head and tail, and you do an experiment, and lo and behold, this is what, what you get. And now I ask you, so notice, I'm not uh, telling you now what are the likely outcomes of your experiment, uh, meaning what are the probability distributions over your space. I am asking you now which coin is the most likely to produce such an outcome. Right? So this is why it's kind of inverse. Probability tells you what you can expect to see as an outcome. What are the features of the outcome? For example, if it's a fair coin, the expected outcomes will be ones that have approximately equal number of head and tails. Likelihood is opposite, it's post factum. You have a realization and you want to figure out what is the probability distribution for the coin that is most likely to produce such an outcome. And this is exactly what I'm telling you, this inversion. It's what machine learning is. What is machine learning? You have outcomes of something, and you want to estimate what is the probability distribution of the variable whose realization you have. That's essentially what machine learning is all about. Just going in the opposite direction. When you have the realization, what is the probability distribution? That pro so what do you think? Which coin is most likely to produce this outcome? Well, let's see. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven heads, right? And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine, nine tails. What do you think? Which coin with what probability distribution uh, for head and tail is the most likely to produce this? What will be the probability of head, of a head? Seven over exactly, seven over sixteen. So seven of right. Uh, let's see why this is so. Right. Well, if I have a coin with the probability of the head is pH, what's the probability to get this outcome? Well, ordering doesn't matter. It is pH. Uh, it is uh, uh, pH to the power 7, right, times 1 minus pH, because this is now probability of the tail, to the power 9. Right? That's if I have a... Pro, uh, um, uh, so this is say the likelihood of uh, this outcome. Um, so, right, because pH has to happen seven times, and one uh, and uh, with uh, the other outcome with probability one minus pH nine times. So I want to see for which pH L is the largest. How do I find this? If this is L of pH, how do you find uh, for which pH this is the largest? Hmm? Oh, come on, people. Have you taken math courses? How do you find the extrema of a function, of a smooth function, of a polynomial? Differentiate. Differentiate, right? <laughs> so what is L prime? of pH, well, the derivative of a product is uh, the derivative of this, which is 7 times uh, pH to the power 6 times 1 minus pH 
to the power 9 plus pH to the power 7 times 9 times 1 over pH to the power 8 and then of course times minus 1 because of this minus here. And so I have to set this equal to 0. And uh, uh, obviously pH cannot be neither 0 nor 1, right? Because the likelihood then is 0. So I can divide by this. So this disappears and this disappears. And I get 7 times 1 minus pH plus, oh sorry, minus 9 times, uh, uh, 9 times, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, 9 times pH, right, has to be equal to 0. Am I not messing up anything? So I divide, so I will have left this one, this one is uh, gone, so everything should be fine, right? So what do I have? I have 7 minus 7 pH minus 9 pH equals 0, so this is 16, so I have, if I put it on the other side, I get 16 pH equals to 7, and lo and behold, this implies that pH is equal 7 over 16, as you would expect. So, so what is, it's kind of Bayesian approach to life, right? You see an event, and you are asking yourself, gee, what could have caused it, right? And which solution do you take? One that is the most likely, right? Uh, now, how good are such estimates, uh, right? This is called maximum likelihood estimates. Uh, actually, they are remarkably uh, good when the size of the sample is large. They are asymptotically uh, the best um, estimators. But if the sample is small, they can be catastrophically bad. <laughs> What would be an example? Assume I have a box, right? And it has some balls inside, uh, say, uh, and you don't, and all the balls have an uh, index, one, two, three, and so forth. Uh, you cannot see what's in the box. The only thing that you can do is you can put your hand in the box, take out a ball, and look at its index. And now you have to estimate how many balls there are in the box. Right? Well, well, assume that you get a, a ball out with the number k in it. In what case will for what number of boxes uh, would this event be the most likely? K. And you have K, because then <coughs> probability, of course, there must be at least K many balls, because you took out one with index K. If there are more than K box, if balls, uh, say n bigger than k, probability to get the k ball out would be 1 over n. All balls are equally likely. So the largest probability is of that event is if there are exactly k many balls. But what do you think? Is this kind of intuitively correct? What would be the best estimate? This is your homework problem. But what would be the best estimate for the number of balls? What would be intuitively, what would you say? 2k. 2k, exactly. You found the middle bound, right? If you have 
a bunch of uh, numbers, right? <coughs> then, and you draw randomly, right? You are more likely, most likely, to get something that is in between and not the mean and mean. Yes? Wait, so the, in this case, the likelihood is you pull out the ball of index 1 and the chances, the chances are there's only one ball in the box. Yeah, so if you use the maximum likelihood estimation, this event is clearly the most likely when there is only one ball because then the probability is 1. So you see, of course, this is because you do a single experiment. If you did 10 experiments, uh, of course, your estimate would uh, dramatically improve. Here is a puzzle for you. It's a pretty tough one. You have to hire, it's called, you, oh no, I'll tell you the juiciest uh, version of it. Uh, so you have this bachelor, and he wants to get married, right? So what does he do? He starts dating girls, right? Well, maybe I can be accused of political incorrectness. He starts dating the partners of his preferred sex. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, he goes out with one girl. If he says, I don't want to marry you, that's it. I mean, she's not going. If uh, He cannot ask her later again. And he has lined up a hundred girls. What should be his best strategy if he does the following? He dates a certain number of girls, right? And figures out which one he likes like the best. And then continues dating until he finds the first girl who is better than the girl, the best girl he what fraction of girls should he date um, and say no before he starts looking for one better than the optimal in the... You get the... 37.5%. 37.5. 37 <laughs> you know what? You are bloody close to the solution. You know the problem, right? Secretary problem. Yeah, it's a secretary problem. Very good. It's uh, interestingly enough, it's 1 over E. And it's a famous secretary, uh, secretary problem. Okay, so, um, so, but when the sample size is large, maximum likelihood estimators tend to perform extremely uh, well. Okay, now uh, let us. Uh, go back to the following problem that I started last time. Maybe I should erase this so that uh, we stay in camera's focus. You know, uh, this piece is one of the reasons why I do these iterative filtering algorithms is, of course, you will take machine learning classes, but 